we're going to get started here. Uh, basically, the way this night is going to work is uh, we've got some uh, music that we're going to sing, and I want to encourage you as we do that, um, whether you know the words or not, uh, focus in on what it is that we're singing together, uh, the truth that we're declaring about the Lord and about his goodness, about our ability um, that he gives us, the freedom he gives us to uh, cry out to him. Um, we'll sing a few songs, and then uh, Leonie will come up and share her testimony, and uh, th then we will sing a few more songs. During those songs, we will take the questions that you have, whatever they are, um, so that uh, the panel can discuss them. So your job right now is to focus on, uh, on the uh, music, on the words that we're singing, and to uh, if you have any questions that you'd um, really like to hear from the panel, um, be filling those out on those sheets of paper that you were given uh, when you came in. So uh, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness to us and your love for us. Father, we ask that your peace your love and your freedom would flow in this place, would flow in our hearts. Speak to us tonight, Lord. Break down strongholds. This is our heart's desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, thank you so much that you are here every hour, every moment, even when we can't hear you, we can't feel you. God, you are faithful. Father, I pray for Leonie as she speaks, Lord, that you would speak through her, that your words would penetrate the hearts of those who are here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite Leonie up. She is my baby sister, and, uh, and she's going to share with you what God has uh, done in her life. So go ahead, sis, you're up. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for coming out here, all the way out here in the dark. <laughs> Hopefully nobody got lost on the way. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony here. Um, I am very blessed by what God's done in my life. The one thing that I want everyone to, um, that I want to get across is that this isn't what I've done. It's what God's done. And it's only by his strength that I've gotten from where I was to where I am today. So here's my story. Um, I've always been an overachiever. Uh, this was made very obvious on my first day of my freshman year of high school when I went up to each of my teachers individually and explained to them that I wanted to do whatever it took to get an A in their class, even if that meant coming in outside of class to get, get extra help. And it didn't stop with grades. I worked my way into the top drama and music classes in high school, and I even spent a summer touring with a Christian music group called the Young Continentals. In 1996, I graduated with honors, and after spending a year at a junior college to save money, because that's the smart thing to do, right? <laughs> I entered Simpson College, ready to work my way up in that world, too. As a Christian, saved at a young age, I wanted to honor God with my life. I wanted to make him proud of me and what I was doing. By the fall of 1998, I was president of the women's choir, a member of a small ensemble, part of a cheerleading squad, and I was being asked to sing at a number of public events. It seemed as if I was a shining success. However, things are not always as they seem. As a child, I was always very fearful. I was afraid of boats, planes, driving over bridges, the dark, roller coasters, you name it, I was afraid of it. At one point, I even started sleeping in my closet because I was afraid that someone was going to come in and take me during the night. These fears led to a need to control everything around me. Subconsciously, I believed that if I could control everything, then I would be safe. When I hit puberty, I began to struggle with my self-image, specifically in relationship to my body and how I looked. As I got older, I began to starve myself in an attempt to acquire the perfect body. More than that, starving gave me a sense of control over my world. I felt like I could do something that others couldn't. 
I could cease to need. I'd always felt like I was too needy and too difficult to deal with. If I could stop needing anything, even things that most people needed for life, then maybe I'd be more valuable, or at least that's what I thought. The problem was that I couldn't stop needing, and that brought a lot of shame. So I would try to control myself using diet pills and laxatives and diuretics. When I would eat, I would try to pay for it by making myself throw up, purging, or by over-exercising. I would exercise for hours, and at times I would even get up in the middle of the night to exercise so that no one would know I was still doing it. The need to control didn't stop there. As I entered college, my eccentricities began to develop into obsessive compulsive disorder, otherwise known as OCD. Patterns would constantly flash in my mind. If something didn't fit into a pattern, I had to make it fit. I was driven to organize everything. I would stay awake at night for hours alphabetizing everything in the house, books, movies, canned foods, spices. My closet had to be in perfect order, like clothing together, in color order, long sleeves to short sleeves, all hanging on the exact same place on the hanger. If everything wasn't just right, I couldn't sleep. I was filled with anxiety. It was exhausting. My need to control was controlling me. As the pressure and stress from school built, my mind turned against me. I had a constant stream of negative and destructive thoughts running through my mind. I believed that I was a worthless waste of space. Although I loved God and wanted to please him, I felt like I constantly failed him. Grace was something I could not grasp. If I ever messed up, made a mistake, or failed at anything, I felt like I had to pay for it. But no matter what I did, it never seemed like enough. My failure at making things right would then push me towards more destructive behaviors. One desperate day in October of 1998, in an attempt to punish myself for my sins, I grabbed a knife and I began cutting my arm. Once I crossed that line, I began to spiral down quickly. For the next week, I w if I wasn't hurting myself, I was thinking about it. The more I self-injured, the more shame I felt. But the more shame I felt, the more driven I was to self-injure. By the end of the week, I'd covered my body from neck to ankles with cuts, all in perfect patterns. Running out of places to cut and desperate to end the cycle I was trapped in, I grabbed a box of pills and I took them all. I went to work that night with my head spinning from the pills. I had no idea what to expect. I was afraid and I desperately wanted to cry out for help, but I felt as if I was being held hostage by the voice of condemnation in my mind. I tried to cry out for God to help me, but I couldn't seem to form a prayer. What I discovered was that he hears the cries from the depths of our heart even when we can't find a voice with which to cry out. What followed was a series of events that only God could have orchestrated. God sent a friend and prompted her to ask just the right questions at just the right time, and he gave me the strength to respond honestly. At that same time, he prompted my parents to come looking for me. My mom found me just as my friend had thrown her arms around me and began praying. By the end of the night, I found myself first in the emergency room of a hospital and next being admitted to a private mental hospital. Every step I took, God would bring someone to encourage me and to reach out to me with his love. And many of these people I had never met before in my life. When I left the hospital six days later, I quit my job and I dropped out of school and I moved back home with my parents. With the stress of school and work gone, and with the support of my family and therapist, I hoped to begin recovery. I planned to take a few weeks off and to return to school in the spring. However, within the first week back at school in January of 99, I ended up right back in the mental hospital. At that point, I left Simpson with no plans to ever return. The next few years were full of ups and downs, as I would begin to recover only to backslide into old, unhealthy ways of coping. 99 brought continued struggles with cutting and depression. I believed that I was a burden and that all I was doing was hurting people. Those beliefs led to a suicide attempt that was nearly successful. 
At that point, I knew that I had to get better or I was not going to make it. I was going to die. I'd hit rock bottom, but God gave me a second chance to fight for life. One month later, I met a man who promised to love me despite all of my problems. Unfortunately, this man was living a very worldly life. I felt very unlovable at the time, and I didn't want to give up the relationship because I felt good when I was with him, and I hadn't felt good in a very long time. So I convinced myself that I could help him and that everything would work out because we loved each other. Soon, my overdependence on him moved in an unhealthy direction. In March of 2000, we ran away together. A few weeks later, I discovered I was pregnant. That was a wake-up call for me. I wanted to be a good mother, and God used that to give me the motivation that I needed to get back on track. My then fiance at the time and I decided that it was time to start turning our lives around and making better choices. So we sought out counseling through the church, and I moved back home with my parents until we could get married. We were married in January of 2001, one month after our daughter's birth. Although our marriage was full of trials, the next few years brought a great deal of healing for me. I met with the pastor of my church and began identifying lies that I had believed, and I learned to let God speak truth to me and heal my past through that. Sadly, the same cannot be said for my husband. A few months after we got married, we found out we were expecting again, but our joy was soon turned to tears when we suffered a miscarriage. My heart was broken, but I was determined to hang on to God through the grief and not to let it push me back into my old ways of coping. My husband, however, grew distant, and all the progress that he had made began to disappear. He quit going to church, and he started hanging out with his old friends again. It wasn't long before he was consumed in a life of drugs. In 2003, I became pregnant again, and a few months after the birth of our second little girl, my husband left. As I struggled to find direction in my life as a single parent, God began to open doors for me to return to Simpson. Simpson, that place where I'd fallen apart, the place that had pushed me over the edge, the place that I'd never planned to return to. Sure, I was doing better, but Simpson? <laughs> Even if I had the courage to go back, it would cost thousands of dollars. I was lucky if I could make rent. But God made it clear. And I had a choice. I could trust God and obey him, or I could run. I couldn't think about everything that it was going to take to get to graduation. That thought overwhelmed me. But I could take one step of faith. I could fill out the application, and I could trust that God was going to provide from there. God not only provided, he went above and beyond. I received a letter in the mail telling me that I had been granted a full ride. My tuition was not only paid, but I had money left over. I don't think I'd ever heard of that happening to anybody. <laughs> um, he then exceeded my expectations by working out all of the details of childcare and my home expenses. Everything was in place, and it was time to go back. In the fall of 2005, terrified, but choosing to walk by faith and not by sight, I returned to Simpson. It was time for God to take back the territory that the enemy had stolen. The next two and a half years were full of trials and what looked like insurmountable mountains. I faced every battle that I'd lost the first time around, only this time I clung to God with every 